In the mid to late 90s, Soul Coughing was an up and coming act that played a unique blend of alternative rock, electronic music, and hip hop. Late night rotation of their music videos would help them amass a cult following, and they'd also solidify their fan base through airplay on alternative radio. Today, we're going to explore whatever happened to the band Soul Coughing. Soul Coughing was formed in New York City by vocalist and guitarist Mike Doty in 1992, who was an aspiring music critic and poet at the time. By his own admission, he was born to be an army brat, as his father taught at West Point. During his early career, he would write for McSweeney's and Might, and wrote a pretty scathing column called Dirty Sanchez for several years in the New York press. He would work as a doorman at the nightclub The Knitting Factory, a club that Spin Magazine referred to as, and I quote, the mecca for avant-garde experimentation. It was at The Knitting Factory where Doty showcased his distinctive spoken word poetry, and others soon took notice. To flesh out his new project, Doty would recruit keyboardist Mike Deli Antony and bassist Sebastian Steinberg, as well as Israeli-born drummer Yuval Gabe, all three of whom were regulars at the club. Doty was significantly younger than his new bandmates, and he barely knew these people, which would later lead to problems down the road. The group's percussionist, Gabe, would perhaps have the most interesting musical background. Born to a Moroccan Jewish family in his home country of Israel, he didn't really have a lot of exposure to rock and jazz growing up but he would be inspired by different sounds he heard on the streets. He would tell the Chicago Tribune, even a faucet running, I'll tap my feet to it until somebody stops me. Mostly I played weddings in Israel. To do that, you have to know how to play Moroccan music or Yemenite music or Russian songs or music from Kurdistan. And if the couple is mixed from different cultures, he'd say. He would end up moving to New York City and joined a percussionist trio who played polyrhythmic experimental rock and they eventually signed to a German record label touring across Asia, Europe, and the United States. He soon branched out to work with hip hop acts and even wrote and choreographed music for the New York dance troops. Soul Coughing would take their name for a slang for throwing up, and the band would rely on unconventional instrumentation, including a guitar, a sampler, an acoustic bass, and drums, to create the music that blended jazz, hip hop, indie rock, and noise experimentation. The band's website in the 90s would list influences ranging from Black Sabbath to Bootsy Collins, a tribe called Quest, and Built to Spill. The band's songwriting style differed from other groups at the time, with Mark Deli Anthony telling Billboard. We're not one of those bands who sits down to write and the thing is in stone after a week. We write music together and flush it out in performance. Until it gets to the point where it may take 10 to 15 performances, it's not really flushed out. Those attending Soul Coughing's live gigs never knew what they were in store for. Some gigs would have them playing completely brand new songs that weren't recorded yet, while other gigs may have them playing fan favorites. With the rising popularity and accessibility of the internet, Soul Coughing took advantage of technology as the band openly encouraged bootlegging of their concerts. Bootleg tapes would be openly traded on a folder dedicated to the band on America Online, something which Doty himself would take part in. In just one year, the band would be signed to Slash Records, and by this point, the label had soon become part of Warner Brothers, giving the band much needed mainstream exposure. Doty would tell the Baltimore Sun what strings came attached to being signed to a major label, saying, you don't necessarily have to choose a category musically, but business-wise, you absolutely, positively have to choose one. And we were very upfront to everybody. Okay, we're an alternative rock band, whether you like it or not. So that's the box that they've thrown us in, radio-wise and marketing-wise, he'd say. The band's first album, Ruby Vroom, would be recorded in 1994 in Los Angeles at Sunset Studio Factory. The group's approach for it would be experimental as they integrated samples of blues and vocal group records as well as scores from vintage cartoons. An article written by Mark Brown of the Chicago Tribune explored the surprising trend of babies and parenting among rock musicians and noted the album's title was a mispronunciation of Ruby Froome, who is the daughter of producer Mitchell Froome and singer-songwriter Suzanne Vega. Interestingly, the studio where Soul Coughing recorded had a number of baby toys in its storage room like rattles, whistles, and mini xylophones, which the producer of the album, Chad Blake, encouraged the band to use. In Doty's 2012 memoir, The Book of Drugs, he praised Blake's approach, saying, He's the closest thing I've seen an engineer come to really being an artist. He put vocals through a big bullhorn on a stick that he found in India, put my microphones and old mufflers and recorded sounds through them and ran sounds recorded with $10,000 microphones through effects pedals he bought for $10 at garage sales. Doty would add he really didn't give an F about how the music sounded anywhere other than the beat up 60s vintage pickup truck he drove between home and the studio. It always sounded amazing there he'd say. Once Ruby Vroom was released, it failed to chart and sold quite poorly, moving less than 100,000 copies in the next few years. 
but it received critical acclaim with Rolling Stone later calling it one of the 40 best mainstream alternative albums of 1994, as well as one of the 100 greatest albums of the 90s. Despite the band's underwhelming debut, their label had faith in them. The product manager for Soul Coughing for Warner Brothers would tell Billboard magazine a few years later, we were not satisfied with the 70,000 records sold, and we will not be satisfied until we reach a greater goal. The band is mining turf that no one else is mining. The product manager would go on to say that the biggest realization they had about Soul Coughing is that the group was capable of being paired up with a variety of artists on the road, including Jeff Buckley and the Dave Matthews Band, only further helping bolster their profile. But Steinberg would tell Billboard magazine, our record company says we have faith in you guys, which becomes more and more loaded. In 1995, during an appearance on the Canadian show The New Music, Doty offered some more insight into Soul Coughing's music, saying it was entirely an accident. I think the only idea that was present before Soul Coughing started was that it was going to be funky. Beyond that, it's been sort of anything goes, and over time it became very closely related to who we are as people and how our particular personalities interact, he'd say. Duval Bay would add, We try to relate to the lower part of the body, have people shake their booty, dance, and just feel good. When asked about what role the band's lyrics play while their music is based on movement, Doty expanded farther, saying, In the nature of language, each word evokes a tremendous amount of things for specific people. What these words are about more than getting across a narrative or expressing an idea is just getting the rhythmic or musical quality of a word into people's minds so that it loops over and over again, and whatever it means to them comes to the front of their mind, he'd say. The same year Soul Coughing started working on their follow-up album, Irresistible Bliss, a record whose main theme consisted of love and heartbreak. In fact, Doty would tell the Orlando Sentinel, not that I exactly have a nation of ex-girlfriends, although it seems that way sometimes. I think I'm blessed with a band that doesn't even listen to the words. No questions ever arise, he would say. The band wanted Chad Blake as a producer again, but due to a death in the family, he was only available for part of the mixing sessions. In the meantime, Doty would go with producer David Kahn, despite objections from both the rest of the band and from his record label. Doty's goal for the album was to have more of a contemporary feel, and as a result, the songs feature catchier and more conventional song structures. He would be pleased with the producer's efforts and would enlist Steve Fisk to produce the track Unmarked Helicopters, which would be included as part of the X-Files soundtrack. Irresistible Bliss would be recorded in only 11 days and was released in 1996. And while the album was less favored by critics, it ended up performing much better commercially than its predecessor, with its opening track Super Bon Bon giving the band their first hit. The album produced another hit with the song's soundtrack to Mary. Drummer Yuval Gabay would tell the Morning Call newspaper, the second record, as usual, is the toughest record to make for a band, and it was indeed a tough record to make. We all bring a sack of puppies with us. Sometimes you have to know not to let a certain puppy out. You have to not hold back sometimes, he'd say. By the late 90s, the band was touring with drum and bass producers Crust and Die, and so their third and final album, El Oso, would feature a sound heavily influenced by electronic music. It was during this time Doty was spending a lot more time in the UK, and he would tell Billboard magazine where his mind was at, saying, Dance culture over there referring to the UK is a lot more interesting than all the post-grunge anthems on US radio. In London clubs, it's all about ecstasy, the movement, and crazy beats. You can hear amazing music one night that you'll never hear again. The only similar situation at home is with bands like Fish and all the hippies at the shows getting effed up and dancing around, he would say. Chad Blake would be brought back as the producer on the group's third album, while also providing synthesizer accompaniment and programming. Once the album was released in 1998, reviews for the record were mixed, but it made the Billboard Top 50 and carried another single, Circles, their biggest yet, which peaked at number 8 on the US alternative charts. A year later, the album was also a number 1 hit on college radio station KTUH in Honolulu, Hawaii. It seemed as though Soul Coughing were on their way to the big time, but Mark Deli Antony left the band to focus on family, and rather than continue on, the band called it quits in May of 2000. Following Soul Coughing's dissolution, bassist Sebastian Seinberg and drummer Yuval Gabay took up session work, while Antony saw success as a composer. Meanwhile, Mike Doty's transition would be initially rough, as by the time the group broke up, he'd grown disenchanted and developed an addiction to various drugs and alcohol. Doty would start his solo career on his own after being dropped by Warner Brothers, selling his debut album Skittish on blank CDRs, while also touring for several years in a rental car. By the time he released his third solo album, 2003's Rockety Roll, he gained enough of a following independently of soul coughing. 
and Dodie's fate would continue to change for the better. The next year after playing the Bonnaroo Music Festival, he met up with Dave Matthews, a longtime fan, who he'd toured with previously with Soul Coughing, who he gave a rough cut of a solo album to he'd been working on, and after a few connections, they'd released the album on Matthews' label, ATO Records. From there, the album singles, Looking at the Wind from the Bottom of a Well and I Hear the Bells, were featured on the show's Grey's Anatomy and Veronica Mars, and Doty found his way back into the mainstream following an appearance on The Late Show with David Letterman. In subsequent years, Doty expressed mixed feelings about his former band. While outside musical projects were given as the main reason for Soul Coughing breaking up in 2000, it went deeper than that, according to Doty. In his book titled The Book of Drugs, he referred to the band as an, I quote, an abusive marriage full of emotional violence. He continued to recognize the importance of the band's music and recorded updated versions of their songs on his 2013 crowdfunded album Circle, Super Bon Bon, and The Very Best of Soul Coughing, and perform Ruby Vroom in its entirety in 2019. He would tell The Village Voice in 2009, I get more and more afraid that a soul coughing reunion is going to be forced upon me a knife point. I don't need money that bad, I swear to God. He would also go on to reveal that soul coughing really didn't make any money during the time they were together, and as a solo artist, he's actually doing better financially. In the same interview with Village Voice, he would state, I was very dumb hanging out with those guys because they just didn't like me from the jump. They were very cruel to me in a lot of ways, put me down in a big way, and I believed them. I was 23 when I started the band, and they were in their 30s. I thought they must be smarter than I am. They must be right. The whole reason this is taking off is because of them. We found all these terrible people we worked with that were essentially like those guys. Soul coughing was this weird universe, the sort of Dante's Inferno, where I was the devil's asshole, and there was the band, the management, the record company, and everybody hated me, he'd say. But as recently as February of 2021, Doty revealed wanting Soul Coughing to get back together and for his latest project, Ghost of Room, to serve as a companion album for their potential comeback. Even though he'd be on good terms with Sebastian Steinberg, the rest of the band didn't seem interested. He would tell the publication Commercial Appeal, I actually wrote Ghost of Room for Soul Coughing, but honestly, I got back a hot plate of crazy. I guess I was expecting that when I went to them, the possibility of a reunion was pretty quickly eliminated, he'd say. Today, Doty has continued Ghost of Room as a standalone band with longtime collaborator Andrew Scrap Livingston. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll Your Stories. Thank <laughs> you.